who are new, for those of you who are returning, welcome to Twish Fisherton for the fourth installment of the Life in the Fishbowl series. Again, thank you for the views. Start subscribing, start liking, because your views are inspiring. And be here yet again for another installment. Everybody has a story, or everybody knows of somebody who has lived with somebody who was terminally ill. So here's my story and my look on it from the age of a 12-year-old to a 15-year-old. Year was 2005, let's say. Um, <clears throat> my mother was sick. Uh, before we even knew she was terminally sick, she was just sick. We assumed it was probably just a stomach virus or some kind of issue going on because she was constantly throwing up. She couldn't keep food down. She was constantly not feeling well. Um, after a couple of weeks of, you know, kind of shoving it off, doing motherly things, being a mother, taking care of her kids, she finally took the time to take care of herself and went to the doctor. I'm assuming the doctor said, you know, you need to take a couple of tests. And I assume that, you know, I was, wasn't told this information. The doctor told her, you know, you have stage four colon cancer that has spread into your liver. The next two and a half years were a big cluster of misunderstanding for me. Um, I had just started middle school. I was in the sixth grade when she told me that she was sick. So I was going through middle school while she was sick. And being at that age and not being able to comprehend properly understand the whole concept of cancer and all that, I wasn't really sure what was going on. It was really nerve wracking the whole time, I would tell you that. The whole time I would classify her as a trooper. She con continued to be the mother, continued to be the wife. It didn't stop her. I was in the choir in school. She would always be at the shows. I played softball. She would never miss my games. She was always at my practices. You know, come home from school, she was right there to ask me how school was because she maintained a job while she was sick that uh, correspond with the children's school schedule. So she was working while we were at school. And there was a period she was a lunch lady. Oh, uh, man. Uh, I wish I could talk to her about that now. Fond memory would probably be coming home from school and she would be watching Ellen. And I would always get home at 3.30, so I would always be there for the half of it, and I would always be mad, so we would watch the rest of Ellen together. Every day when I came home from school, that was a ritual that me and my mom had together. Very fun. <laughs> I think the sad part of her trying to stay strong for the two and a half years that she fought which I feel bad about myself was the whole time she was planning her death. And, you know, funeral homes, caskets, whatever. She, she got cremated, so, you know, you got to look at the burial plots and all that. And um, that had to be very tragic because I would ask her where she was going when she'd be going places on weird days at weird times. And she wouldn't tell me where she was going. But now that I'm older, I understand where she was going. I remember when she was getting real sick, she was losing a lot of weight. Mind that, my mom was a 250 pound woman. She was a big lady, beautiful. She looks like me, I get my looks from my mother. She died at 90 pounds. But closer to the end, her humor started coming out because I was a little older, so you know, I was getting some of her humor. She never stopped making dinner. Even when her hair started falling out from the chemotherapy, she started wearing a hairnet because she didn't want the hair to get into our food. It's, I, don't, I don't think it ever happened to me. I don't know about my brothers or my dad, but I never found her hair in my food. But she started wearing a hairnet, and then it got to the point where I remember I wasn't home when it happened, but I called her. One day I was, was staying with my uncle, and um, she's like, I got something to tell you. I was like, what? And she's like, I shaved my head. And I'm like, nah, -uh. and she's like, yeah, I shaved my head. 
So I asked her, I'm like, Mom, are you going to wear a wig? I'm like, are you going to be one of those people that wear a wig? And she said, no, Trisha, I'm not. People are going to see me as who I am. I am a cancer patient. That's who I am. You take me as I am. Be as you are. Quote from Michelle Murray Richardson. Even after the chemotherapy took her hair, that didn't stop my mom from being a mom. It didn't stop her from being a wife. It didn't stop her from leaving the house. Even when the cancer itself combined with the chemotherapy took my mom's strength and she couldn't walk and she had to be in a wheelchair most of the time to even get out of the house, my mom did it. She rode with two wheels on a wheelchair like a gangster to get out of the house while she was bald. My mom was a thug life chick. Having cancer did not affect my mom at all. The only time it stopped her was when it confined her to the bed because her body physically couldn't take it anymore. My mom did not stop being a mother till she physically could not do it. And that is fucking inspiring. So living with my sick mother for those two and a half years that she battled her cancer made me a stronger person because of the way that she handled it. So hopefully this video reaches out to you guys and you can relate to my story and know that just because you lost your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your aunt, your uncle, your grandma, your grandmother, father, whoever, don't let it control your life. You can fight it. You can get past it. And that's why I'm making these videos. In depth, from the heart, fish is out.